with any luck tonight, we're going to, you know, as a, as a point of departure uh, for this gathering, you just look at the news. I don't know how many of you read The Australian recently, but it talks about the British submarine program being in trouble. And then it talks about the American submarine program being in trouble. And then it talks about the AUKUS submarine program being in trouble. So, uh, you know, they might be right, it's in trouble. Okay, well, you can't win them all. And, you know, maybe it's in trouble. Uh, what we're gonna talk about tonight, I think actually in its own way, uh, as I say, is more interesting than the fate of that submarine. And well, you know, Brian uh, in, in, in the Hudson put together a, a paper where more or less was uh, trying to give advice not to Australia or to Japan, but to the United States, which is much tougher nut, you know, to take advice. Um, and the advice that we'll hear about tonight, I think goes to the future of not just AUKUS, but of the US military and the allied militaries. And uh, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll try to uh, capsulate it. Uh, it could be that spending money on platforms that are crude, that have long range and multi missions, and then try to protect themselves against being hit by unmanned systems by having long range unmanned systems themselves, is a loser's game. Uh, roughly, this is the game we're in, <laughs> but. It may be a loser's game. And if it is, you want to know what makes more sense. And I think what tonight we're going to be talking about is just that. And it's it could be that the real value of AUKUS is getting others in, in the region, including the United States, to pay attention to what makes more sense. Now, I know uh, it's not considered kosher to think that Australia should be a leader, but they might be. I always say, uh, as my wife points out, they Australians fight above their weight. Well, something to think about. And tonight, uh, I think we're going to get a real treat. Now, what is the order of battle, Brian? It does, is there are three of you. Uh, who speaks first? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so oh, I was thinking that... Raised. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking that um, you know maybe Marcus could start um, talking about the context uh, as he sees it from somebody who straddles both government and industry and Australia and, and often the U.S. Um, you know, and then I can sort of talk about you know what what we've learned from the U.S. case and and how we you know recommended the ADF pursue it. Um, you know, and then you know we we close out with the, uh, the Brigadier's comments. Well, okay. Now, if you take a look at the bio for Mr. Heller, um, it's really quite intriguing. So I won't try to go all the way through it. I recommend you take a look. I think what stands out to me is that he's a history buff. More than that, a professor has PhD in it. And he also obviously has a nose for strategic thought because he, he did a, uh, a, t a, a stint at San Diego, which strikes me as the right place to be generally. I mean, you know, if you can't be in Australia, being in San Diego is not a bad runner, runner up. Uh, so well, you know, I, I lived in San Diego for eight years in the bottom left corner of the U.S. and then in Boston for five years in the top right corner. And uh I don't really know much about what's in between, so you know. That's probably, okay. You know, That's okay. You, you picked at least, at least in one case. You, you picked because a I just haven't spent enough yeah. time in this kind of. Yeah. Well, that's all right. I didn't say you were an expert about America. I just said you landed in at least one place. It's pleasant, very pleasant, and uh, the history connection I think is interesting as well. I mean, he's worked in the defense sector, uh, in public service and intelligence, um, but he now is uh, 
while he still teaches, he's he's doing work with uh, uh, a private firm that's caught up in uh, autonomous systems for military applications. So, you know, this is, you would say, extremely applied history. How's that? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sort of I'm on to my fourth career. How many careers are we meant to have nowadays? Well, uh, anyway, I, I, let me let me recommend what my, a friend of mine who had a trajectory similar to yours uh, did: acupuncture. I just they cap it out with that. You know? So yes, yeah, so I had my my truly academic career working on 17th century theology. I was then a public servant in the Department of Defense. I was then a think tanker, and now I'm working with industry. Um, on, on autonomous systems, and uh, it's right. incredibly fun, and I'll talk about that a little. So, so I can start. You know, if I've gone too long, just give me the. You know, well, get I off, think you know. in deference to the three of you, each of you should go about ten minutes, and if you go much beyond that, it's it's kind of rude behavior. Yeah. I don't think I've ever spoken for less than 10 minutes, so you may need to give me a, a second. Well, we, we have, we have a... Well, uh, thanks a thanks for having me. I, I, spoke, I spoke in this forum about a year and a half ago, and it was great to do that. And uh, it's, it's thank you for having me back, and hello to everybody. There's a number of familiar faces there, so and very nice to see you all. So I'm going to sort of have two quick sections. The first one is talking about autonomous systems and do they actually have the ability to do real stuff, which is kind of the question Henry sent around. And the second bit is what does AUKUS have to do with this, if, if anything at all? So to sort of set the scene, I'll start with two anecdotes, sort of competing anecdotes. So in February of this year, the US Army announced that it was canceling its future armed reconnaissance aircraft program. So its future sort of helicopter, quasi attack, quasi reconnaissance helicopter. And the Chief of Staff of Army, General Randy George, specifically explicitly justified the decision based on lessons learned from the war in Ukraine. So he said, we are learning from the battlefield, especially in Ukraine, that aerial reconnaissance has fundamentally changed. Sensors and weapons mounted on a variety of unmanned systems and in space are more ubiquitous, further reaching and more inexpensive than ever before. So, so that's one reality, I guess. Meanwhile, back in Australia, the Australian Army is kicking off the acquisition of a new fleet of Apache attack helicopters at a cost of five billion Australian, roughly three and a half billion in, in real dollars. And, and that's to buy 29 aircraft. And, and so after the US announcement, at a parliamentary hearing, our chief of army was asked, why are you still doing this? You know, why are you going down that pathway? And uh, the chief of army here answered, one of the important things about the Apache helicopter, and one of the reasons why it was selected for the Australian Defence Forces use, is that it has the capacity to human machine team. In other words, as we move from a predominance of crude systems to a predominance of uncrewed systems, there's a very necessary waypoint in between, which we described as human machine team, so Humpty. That's the combination of crude and uncrewed systems. And, and so I think you know that's a, an encapsulation of the Humpty philosophy and, and quote, it's a very necessary waypoint. Well, uh, what I sort of want to argue is I think we should think really carefully about whether it is a necessary waypoint. Okay. So to me, a lot of the Humpty philosophy is built around um, recovering value from stranded assets. So assets that are no longer viable, we're going to find a, a new use for them and, and recover some of the, the sunk cost, the billions and billions and billions of sunk cost in them. But I'd, I'd, I'd argue if um, to do that, you're still reliant on those exquisite, expensive crude systems, the ones that cost billions to build, uh, take decades to design, decades to build, and that we are essentially ending up with fewer and fewer of them. And so what you're still kind of designing your, your force around that, which limits, I would argue, your ability to really exploit the value 
of you know the, the small, the smart, and the many. And you're still building in this kind of exquisite single point of failure into your, your system. And I'd also argue that it sort of relies on a view of autonomous systems that is increasingly less valid. So it relies on a, a view that autonomous systems and uncrewed systems can't do the job by themselves and they need essentially to be extensions of those crude systems. And I'll just quickly outline four factors that I think um, suggest we can skip that waypoint or, or at least accelerate past it in a way that was faster than we might have expected a few years ago. So the, the first point is, is that, you know, we are seeing greater levels of autonomy being achieved by uncrewed systems all the time. You know, classic one example is that the US Ghost Fleet. So these sort of medium-sized autonomous vessels you know, have, have operated in the Middle East. They've visited uh, Australia. They were in Sydney Harbour, you know, and they got there autonomously. So real uh, autonomy at real uh, meaningful ranges. The second point is that uh, we're seeing greater levels of physical performance, not just reliability, so you can sail around the world without breaking down, but range. And so real kind of strategically meaningful range. You, you don't need to be carried on a crude system to actually get to you know, significant places. Uh, I think third is kind of a, a mental uh, development, and that is I think we're more willing to think about how much autonomy is enough. You know, so we're moving past the view that autonomous systems have to do everything that crude systems can do. So as we're seeing in Ukraine, people are, you know, ruthlessly exploiting the benefits provided, you know, even by a little bit of autonomy. And in fact, you know, just the ability for a, a UAV to fly without me needing to steer it all the time is a huge advantage. I mean, I can fly a UAV and, you know, and I'm a technological idiot, you know, so, you know, just small developments in autonomy make huge differences. And <clears throat> I think the fourth development is the realization that the designing, the fielding and the evolving of uncrewed systems is many, many orders of magnitude faster than traditional platforms. And, and we're seeing that uh, evolution in action in a, you know, that dynamic ecosystem in Ukraine. So I think, you know, even clunky old militaries like the US and Australia are sort of slowly getting to this tipping point. I think the US Department of Defense's replicator program is um, sort of evidence of that. But of course, Ukraine is sort of way ahead of us. Um, you know, it's or it's made 200,000 drones this year and is aiming to make several million this year. But the the interesting number to me is not the sheer number of drones, but the variety. So I was meeting some Ukrainian think tankers two evenings ago, and they said, you know, they're aiming to have a thousand drones. And we're like, what? That doesn't actually sound like many. And they're like, no, a thousand kinds of drones. And we said, why? And they said, well, because, you know, when you have that variety, it presents dilemmas to the adversary. It means, you know, you can uh, pick the best ones. It means different people can specialize in different kinds. And, you know, it's a very different view from us where it's like, we're going to have one SSN, you know, or one fighter plane. It is just literally let a, a thousand flowers bloom. Um, now, in Australia, as in the US, we still, despite a slow acknowledgement of we're reaching a kind of tipping point, our investment is, there's still a massive imbalance of investment. So for example, our government has said it's going to cost 50 to 58 billion Australian dollars over the, the coming financial decade to, uh, we'll spend that just on our SSN program. That will get us to the handover of the first Virginia class submarine around 2032-33. So that's 58 billion Australian, that's sort of roughly 35 or 40 billion US of expenditure over the coming decade that actually will give us no capability during that decade. And then similarly in the, the Hunter class frigate program, our big uh, new frigate, that's gonna be 25 to 30 billion Australian. So again, over the decade to get us to delivery of the first ship. 
so again, no actual capability during that period. So you add them together and we're looking at 80 to 90 billion Australian. So, you know, 60, 65 billion US just on those two classes of vessel uh, to get to the delivery of the first ship. You know, it's a massive opportunity cost, massive opportunity cost. Now, I think our defence force is going, well, that's expenditure is justified because the Indo-Pacific is different, you know, and we sort of hear this in in uh, quite often over here. So the chief of defense force here has said, we don't wanna learn the wrong lessons from Ukraine. Now they haven't actually said what the right lessons from Ukraine are, but you know, we don't wanna learn the wrong lessons. And uh, the wrong lesson seems to be to stop this massive investment in traditional platforms, whether they're helicopters, submarines or, or ships. But look, I wanna suggest the Indo-Pacific actually isn't that different. And I'll use um, C2 Robotics, Speartooth an example. So I, I worked as a strategic advisor to C2 Robotics, uh, and they make a LUUV, so a large, uncrewed underwater vessel. But I, 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 you also use the L to mean long range. So by long range, so this is a system that's uh, 11 meters long, so roughly 35 feet long, about a meter uh, in diameter, so about three and a bit feet in diameter. And it's basically an underwater Tesla. So it's packed full of batteries, lithium ion batteries, which provide it with huge range. So several thousand kilometers of range. So, you know, potentially a couple of nautical, a couple of thousand nautical miles of range. And of course, if you don't need it to come home, you can double that number. And so what that means is it can access uh, areas of strategic interest to Australia itself from the Australian mainland. So it can reach what we sort of refer to as our first island chain, you know, stealing that term from the, the Chinese. And, and if you put it in a container and it's easy to break it down and put it in a container, you know, you can operate from Singapore and access the entire South China Sea, or as Brian has suggested, from the Philippines, and you can access the Taiwan Strait, for example. And it's designed from the outset to be extremely cheap, so you can generate mass uh, easily. So if we go into commercial production, it'll be well under half a million Australian dollars, so potentially, you know, 300,000 US. It's made of commercial off-the-shelf components, could be made at civilian, existing civilian manufacturing facilities. You don't need dedicated uh, facilities to build it. And so you can very easily and quickly generate mass. But the whole, I, the whole idea is to break out of the cost capability death spiral, you know, that spiral we're in where, you know, we're building designing and building ships and submarines that cost multiple billions of dollars each. You know, and to do that, you so we are being absolutely ruthless about requirements. You know, we're being absolutely ruthless about integration. It's actually faster and simpler to have multiple kinds of spear tooths, each carrying different payloads, rather than trying to integrate, you know, a bunch of different payloads onto the one spear tooth. And because it's so cheap, you can have that. We can have lots of different subfleets of spear tooths, each carrying a different payload. And, and um, you know, again, to, uh, call out to Brian. You know, this is you know mosaic warfare in action. So the the kinds of concepts that Brian's been talking about for a long time now. You know, we're really trying to put them into action. But and the other thing we sort of realized is that for a, a large number of missions, a little bit of autonomy is enough. You know, if you want to take a payload a long way and deliver it somewhere and that that somewhere may be underneath a ship you know in another harbor you know several thousand kilometers away you don't actually need much autonomy to do that at all and so yeah yeah add all of that together and it's i would argue that you know it's potentially uh, allowing us to jump that that Humpty step, you know, that it's not really necessarily a, a mandatory waypoint on the way to a much more autonomous future. So, you know, people often say, well, oh, you could put Speartooth on an amphibious ship and, you know, carry it closer to the fight. And my response is, well, Speartooth is incredibly stealthy. Why do I want to put it on a big fat floating target? You know, when I can get there myself without that reliance on the big fat floating target. So very quickly, what does AUKUS have to do with this? And, um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, I, I'd be cautious about AUKUS. Um, partly, you know, because so much of AUKUS is about pillar one, so the SSN 
uh, pillar, which is sucking all of the oxygen, all of the money, all of the headspace, all of the industrial resources, you know, out of um, sort of our broader defense enterprises. So, you know, in many, many ways, pillar one is a huge opportunity cost. The other thing I'd argue is that if you adopt a Humpty approach and you build your kind of force of the future around exquisite crude systems like SSNs, you know, you've really ruled, cut yourself off to the possibilities of the small, the smart, and the many. Okay. We, if AUKUS pillar one works, at some point in, you know, 30 years time, we will have eight SSNs. Okay. I, I can give you hundreds or thousands of spear tooths in the next couple of years, you know. So, um, and one of the things that's driving the cost of SSNs is, is the Humpty approach. So, you know, we've learned that uh, SSN, the US Navy's follow on uh, SSN, you know, it's been delayed because of budget pressures. Um, it's growing in cost. Why? Well, because it's growing in size. So it can be that so-called mothership to smaller autonomous systems. And I think that approach is taking us further and further down the losing model, you know, the, the cost capability death spiral. Um, so I would be very cautious about, you know, building your future force around the pillar one kind of approach. Um, the, the second point is that AUKUS, I think, is a kind of very traditional model of doing business. It's very, it's driven by bureaucracies. It doesn't, I think, effectively tap into the innovation of industry. So as an example, AUKUS, the first announcement was two and a half years ago. It took two years to get to the big announcement in December last year where the three national leaders released a, a shopping list of 12 uh, pillar two activities. Okay, um, so two years to, to get there. To, just to say, here's some of the things we plan on doing. Well, and then you go, well, what are we actually doing? So I had a quick look at Oztender, which is uh, a website that shows all of the Australian government's contracts and approaches to market. After two and a half years, there are only three references to AUKUS there. One of them is for furniture. For, for the AUKUS office. So, um, but I will say that just recently, um, the, uh, the ASCA, the Australian Strategic Capabilities Accelerator, our sort of clone of DARPA, did put out a, a notification about um, one AUKUS activity in the electronic warfare space. But it's, that's taken us nearly two and a half years. Okay, so, um, and I guess finally, one point, oh, yeah. what... Yes. Okay, what actually is AUKUS? So at the one hand, it, is it this kind of, um, this we get efficiencies because we avoid duplication. So if Australia develops something good, all three partners are going to buy it. Well, that's never going to happen. I mean, the US is not going to, you know, be reliant on Australia. So is it this approach where we get everybody smart people and we put everybody smart people in a room you know, and we'll get these amazing synergies by having all of these smart people in a room. Well, um, all I would say in response to that is to refer to the old Chinese saying is, if you want to travel fast, travel alone. You know, and I'd argue that's why it's taken us two and a half years just to put out kind of a shopping list of things we'd like to do under Pillar 2. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Sorry for going yes, too well. Going. Yes. Um, Brian... Uh, Clark is the uh, uh, the Hudson half of this series of workshops, and uh, as I say, he's he now is planning to retire since he reached the apex of his career by joining NPEX Advisory Board. And he's <laughs> he's decided to go to a remote Pacific island. That's really the reason why he's been so interested in AUKUS to figure out where to buy that. But That's right. It could take a couple of weeks, I'm hoping. And before any of that happens, I'm kidding, of course, uh, we should listen to Brian because I think his mixture of uh, government service, uh, military service, and you know, uh, contract study work for, for the Pentagon, uh, I think has really reached a, a culmination point in the latest study that he's done. 
And I think it's it's grist, not just or even primarily for Australia. It's grist for us. And we can only hope that the Australians love us enough to embarrass us on this front. Brian, go ahead. Uh, you know, thanks, uh, Henry. And uh, thanks, Marcus, for that terrific uh, intro. I thought uh, all that, I mean, I agree with all of that. And I think it was very, uh, a very concise, actually, consolidation of a lot of uh, issues that are around uh, AUKUS Pillar 2 in particular. Um, I asked David to see if he could set up screen sharing for me because I want to show some of the graphics from the report that uh, Henry's referring to. Um, so while he's David, doing that, while he's doing that. Well, he'll, he'll uh, try to distribute the URL for that report uh, if he hasn't right. already. I know we tried to get the short uh retail version out which was a op-ed <laughs> but you know we we have the names i don't think that'll be difficult yeah so the uh you know what we highlighted uh there we did a study for the um, australian defense force looking at how they could improve their fielding of unmanned systems around pillar two because pillar two obviously is where i think a lot of the value might come out of AUKUS. you know and as we discussed the submarine element of it, pillar one, is you know having challenges, and I think down the road is probably going to be suffering from funding shortfalls that might prevent it from really coming to fruition. Um, and here in the U.S., there's going to be resistance when it comes to selling submarines to Australia that are coming out of the current U.S. inventory, uh, because in that time frame, you will have you know 50 or so submarines, and um, of which you know 35 might be operational on any given day. And then selling uh, three to six of those to Australia might not be very palatable to the Congress that exists at that time. Uh, so 10% of the submarine force that's operational would be going to Australia. Um, I mean, I think it's a good idea. They should do it. But I think there could be a lot of resistance at the time, uh, as well as the challenge of Australia being able to pay for them, as well as the, the follow on construction of a, a new SSN class. So I think all of those things together mean it's a pretty fraught path you know, that we're on with Pillar 1. So Pillar 2 presents you know, an opportunity to get some value out of AUKUS. Uh, and uh, Pillar 2, though, encompasses technologies that in some cases are pretty intangible, uh, unclear what the national security uh, relevance might be. Quantum you know, still has to prove itself out as, as having some national security use cases. Um, you know, Space, obviously, there's some opportunities there. But unmanned is really where most of that value is going to come. And you know, Marcus uh, and you know his company, um, CG Robotics with Speartooth. Um, there's other uh, companies in Australia. You know, there's Androl as well as um, uh, Oceus, which has the Blue Bottle USV. There's companies in Australia that have technology that might be valued to the U.S. So there could be opportunities for the reverse, um, you know, transfer of technology back to the U.S. rather than this simply being the U.S. and U.K. transferring technology to Australia. The um, uh, what we found in our study, though, you know, looking at you know, how would Australia incorporate these technologies, in particular uh, you know, unmanned systems into the force more quickly, was uh, just the, the, a lot of the same challenges that we have in the U.S. You, know, you have to have a way to identify the use case. How are these systems going to be employed to create the pull you know, that, that uh, forces the department to uh, pursue their development and purchase and incorporate them into the force? And then also... Um, You've got to have the ability to integrate them, you know, with each other uh, and with the overall military. Um, and you know, Marcus, as Marcus said, you know, one of the challenges with this idea of manned unmanned teaming or human machine teaming is it's a huge amount of effort to figure out how to make the manned and unmanned stuff work in the same battle space, be able to communicate with each other, do the mission planning and mission management. By putting the people and the machines in the same operating area, it makes it much more complicated and slows and down. You know, the process of integration. Uh, so we're seeing in the US, you know, the examples um, of the medium unmanned surface vessel, large unmanned surface vessel, uh, loyal wingman, collaborative combat aircraft, all these programs are being slowed because they're trying to mesh together the manned and unmanned. Um, so one of the value, one of the opportunities we saw was well, keeping the unmanned stuff in its own family and <laughs> having it being deployed and developed, developed and deployed um, as part of a, a independent force. And so uh, we called that a hedge force because we intended it to be a hedge against uh, potential scenarios where demand force just isn't up to it. Um, for the U.S., that could be the China-Taiwan invasion, where we could use a hedge force to uh, disrupt and slow a Chinese invasion you know, by putting these unmanned systems into the Taiwan Strait. They could be deployed from you know, nearby islands. 
Now that gives you a way to hedge against that scenario. It prevents, prevents us from having to optimize the US military for that scenario gives us the ability to keep the U.S. military a little bit more multifunctional uh, compared to you know, the direction that we have been going, which is all submarines and bombers um, and maybe some uh, high-end destroyers and you know not a lot of uh, uh, amphibious ships or troop formations or uh, tactical aircraft. So, so that, that shift um, of putting the unmanned systems in their own force, this hedge force idea, was very attractive to the ADF. They liked the idea of maybe pursuing that for some of the missions where they didn't feel like they had sufficient capacity in the manned force. And it also frees them of this integration challenge. Um, now, the, the difficulty they still have, uh, which the U.S. has it in part, is the ADF doesn't have the ability to really do the kinds of modeling and simulation you would need to do to envision the, the use of these systems. So these unmanned systems are become available. How do you envision their uh, operation? How do you uh, do the modeling to figure out what the communication requirements are going to be? How well can they sense the environment? How well can they do operations? Um, so you have to have that front end sort of modeling and simulation to even figure out what the art of the possible is with the systems you can get um, either domestically you know, or, or overseas. Um, and then you've got to be able to uh, go do some prototyping, which Australia has done quite a bit of in, in uh, exercises like Autonomous Warrior. But then on the back end, once you come up with a prototype that works and you say, I love this system of systems, it does the job that we need it to do. Um, then I've got to figure out how to pull it together and operationalize it, meaning I got to have a communication network for it. I've got to have some kind of computer based mission planning tool. I've got to have a way to uh, field it and have it someone maintain it and sustain it in the field. Um, so it's got to be put into a position where it can be employed, especially if it's a hedge force that's got to be able to respond you know, to enemy attacks or enemy aggression. I um, mean, that's another area where uh, the ADF has got you know, shortfalls because it doesn't have that really robust engineering and uh, kind of warfare center structure like in the U.S., um, and it doesn't have necessarily the industrial base or the contractors that do that kind of work um, like they do in the U.S. So there's been a lot of reliance on contractors and vendors to do that integration effort uh, and then do some of the sustainment of these systems uh, in the field. But that, those are some of the challenges that they have where I think there's opportunities for cooperation. So it's almost like the cooperation with the U.S. is more on the um, infrastructural, you know, institutional side, uh, whereas the technologies are available in Australia. And I, I think that's one one interesting insight that we gained from the work we did with the US and with the uh, Australian DOD was, Australia's DOD probably can give some insights to the US on technology, but the US can give some help to Australia in terms of yeah, how do you pull something together and then field it in a way that's operational. Uh, so those, those are some differences compared to what I think people would intuitively think in terms of an AUKUS technology transfer relationship. Um, and then the uh, last thing I'll mention um, is, you know, to, to Marcus's point, when you think about the systems that we should be pursuing, um, the U.S. approach up till recently has been to try to build robots that essentially can do the same thing a manned platform can do, uh, maybe just uh, a in a little more limited way. So, for example, they're buying a large unmanned surface vessel that's designed to be a missile magazine, just like a destroyer would but it doesn't do the other things the destroyer does. But it does mean that the large unmanned surface vehicle has to operate for long periods of time, over long distances, um, go relatively fast uh, and be relatively survivable because it's going to be driving around the ocean by itself. Um, so those make it a very expensive and complex machine that the Navy has found is probably unworkable, too expensive to really warrant the investment for an unmanned system that does only one thing. Um, the other, the alternative approach is to look at what's available in the market in terms of unmanned systems that are you know, much more you know, functionally less sophisticated. So like Marcus said, they do one function. They basically can do one or maybe two functions each, and you just build them to do those one or two functions. And if you need multiple functions, you get multiple vehicles. Um, that's a much less expensive approach. Now the complexity shifts from inside the vehicle to outside the vehicle. So now you've got to have, that's why the mission management and mission planning capabilities are so important because you tr as you transition from that kind of self-contained, you know, very complex vehicle to a much simpler vehicle, you got to have a way to manage it. This is the same approach that Amazon uses in its warehouse uh, robotics um, architectures. They shifted from trying to build robots that did what people did to instead 
just buying the robots that were available and then build the workflow around uh, what the what the robots can do. So people do what people can do best, robots do what they can do. And then when they get new robots, they can redo the workflow, but the management of the robots becomes important then uh, because they're not able to do everything by themselves. So that's, so those those trends towards simpler robots that do less, um, you know, but are, are smart, but they're maybe not uh, as sophisticated as I think, you know, people might envision for a loyal wingman. Um, that's a trend we're seeing. Ukraine is, is de depicting this in spades. Um, and that drives the complexity from inside to outside. That That's why it drives the need for these kind of uh, computer-based mission management and planning tools. Uh, and that's an area where I think there's a lot more cooperation that can happen between the U.S. and Australia. So I'll stop there and um, I'll hand it back over to you, Henry. Okay. All right. The, the last speaker I, is someone I'm uh, new to, but if you read uh, his biographical information, uh, it's really impressive. And I say this as someone who uh, at least enlisted. Of course, I think the U.S. military had enough horse sense to reject me. Uh, so everybody was safer. <laughs> but one of the things that one can imagine but rarely sees is someone who actually sees serious combat and command uh, but is able to reflect and add to the scholarship of this most uh, you know brutal and natural activity there are very few people that do that i mean extremely limited numbers I think tonight we, we have someone who has done this and done it well. I mean, it, he has commanded troops in combat in a number of very, very uncomfortable places, received awards for his courage, I assume, and, and, and judgment. Uh, but then in addition, you know, has contributed immensely to the scholarship of warfare. Um, so... He's sort of a model for the rest of us, I think. <laughs> and and uh, what's most important is he, he has been thinking a great deal about the future of warfare, which is what this meeting and what I think AUKUS ultimately has to be about. So we couldn't do any better than to have our third speaker uh, give us some of his insights on the presentations and his own thoughts on this. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that very kind introduction. And to uh, friends, new friends and colleagues, um, it's a great privilege to catch up with you and share with you some insights as it relates to, you know, what some would see as probably the most significant technology sharing partnership that certainly from an Australian point of view, uh, we will use to either contribute to or undermine uh, our security status in a part of the world which is dynamic, no doubt, and which is subject to some change and competition, which hopefully doesn't lead to, but could potentially result in the next major theatre war. Um, I'm coming to you today from Dallas Airport. I've just spent the last two weeks here in the US. <laughs> so my plane's been delayed, so I've got plenty of time to chat now. But I've just spent the last two weeks talking to Congress, the Senate, various think tanks around town, uh, officials in defence, state, business, industry, uh, members of the Australian Embassy here and also the UK Embassy on the very important topics around AUKUS. We've had some good reflections from uh, US political insiders on the risks and opportunities that are apparent in the forthcoming Nas National uh, Defence Authorisation Act, the passing of Title III of the De Defence Production Act last year, the opportunities as it relates to resource um, access to uh, high level R&D as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. The intersection of some of those great power shifts that the CHIPS Act will allow, including the onshoring of some of those very important semiconductors on the technologies we're talking about tonight. Uh, and the maybe, maybe not uh, constant debate around ITARs and how Australia and non-US members of these technology sharing agreements uh, need to uh, survive in an environment where that may or may not become a uh, an issue going forward. Um, AUKUS Pillar 2 really does reflect, I think, from an Australian context, uh, some of our grand strategic traditions. And I know Marcus would have a view on whether we have any, uh, and he'd be 
um, half right in sort of submitting that. But I, I would I would argue that you can see in the history of our strategic tradition that we certainly relied very heavily since the end of the Second World War on our alliance and also our technology edge, if you will, compared to others in the region. Uh, and indeed, it's the case now that that edge uh, has disappeared uh, or is much reduced. And now AUKUS Pillar 2 means different things to different member countries. But for us, it's how we think about how to regain a technology edge in a part of the world which is really subject to an arms race uh, and uh, relative to others, uh, technology will be one of those critical dividends in terms of determining how conflict uh, is either avoided or how it commences and certainly uh, how it ends. Um, I'd share and agree with uh, the thesis tonight that robotics and autonomous systems are very much part of the strategic calculus in Australia as to how you achieve scale. And in a part of the world where we've got eight and a half million square kilometres of land, 10 and a half million square kilometres of maritime, um, it's never going to be the case that we can afford in people alone to build the kind of military force options that uh, ignore the reality of our circumstance. And that is we need our alliance and we need our technology to build mass scale and manoeuvre uh, if we're going to be infect effective in the way that we need to as described in our strategic environment. Uh, it's important to note that uh, unlike previous white papers, and this is relevant to AUKUS Pillar 2, the acknowledgement that the 10-year strategic warning time, a notion really born out of the Cold War as it relates to direct military invasion of the continent, is now no longer fit for purpose. And so accepting this, there is a reality of our circumstance that on one hand, we need to invest into technologies that deliver offset capabilities. Um, but on the other, there is a fight tonight dilemma as well in that you know, I would assess 80% of what's currently in the military inventory uh, will still be there between now and 2035 when it comes to when conflict, tragically or not, may happen uh, in our part of the world. And so how do we accelerate that? How do we recognise um, this uh, pickle that we're in and how do we use technology to generate the kind of force options that can de-risk the reality that we've got a fight tonight dilemma uh, that we're way behind on? And yet we want to build uh, programs and activities that are, um, you know, uh, financially and policy responsible, uh, yet extrapolate beyond the time period that's relevant to some of this uh, threat environment we're into. I think the debate around the autonomy infusion into the optimal pathway of AUKUS Pillar 1 is a live debate. You know, that's a sort of Block 5 or Block 6 of the Virginia-class submarine, which Australia is in line to receive under AUKUS Pillar 1, which I think sits in contrast to the technology curve uh, as it relates to undersea domain warfighting and autonomy uh, in that regard. I think the two can happily coexist. And I'm not suggesting anyone has said tonight that this is an either-or equation, uh, but an and-and one. So to come back to Marcus's point around human and machine teaming, whilst I think there will be an inflection point where the greater proportion of mass and scale will be robotic sometime in the future. We're certainly not there yet. And I think we need to catalyze that by being able to leverage what's in the inventory now, being able to systemize that into a network that can harness robotics and autonomous systems, and then use that to effectively slingshot that technology across the next five to 10 years to give the whole system essentially a robotic and emerging advanced technology reset. And that also gives capacity for other technologies to include AI, to include, you know, the, the fusion of advanced radar to be able to bring innovation as a noun and a verb into our sort of hyperscale when it comes to acquisition, to think really hard about what undersea capability means for autonomy. And also, as discovery moments occur across quantum, uh, across AI, which I've already mentioned, and across some of these other really important offset capabilities, uh, that we don't repeat the lesson that perhaps we're learning now with robotics where we, we want long lead times to bring to a problem that exists today, but rather we've got that sort of spiral adaptive approach that they can come in as soon as they are uh, capable in a military applied context and not wait for the various regulations and requirements of operating in peacetime to get in the way of that. Just on to AUKUS Pillar 2 quickly, um, it pays 
I think good dividends to read the UK's integrated review, obviously the variations of the, the varied uh, US uh, national security statements, and indeed our own defence strategic review, which is due to be supplemented with a strategy update or a national defence strategy release sometime in the next 30 days. But really it does emphasise the alliance as the tech dividend. And by that, I mean, we need to get better at what I like to call burden sharing. So it's not efficient, in my view, to have a $300 million autonomous system uh, program as part of Replicator in the US and to have a very meagre $1.2 million equivalent in Australia as a bit of a feel-good exercise when it would be, to my mind, more efficient under the 23 technology sets of AUKUS Pillar 2 to perhaps appoint leads and then to burden share that work so as a collective it can be harnessed and again you can generate real momentum and real scale and of course to do that you need to also be able to integrate and exchange workforce so you know how do you how do you scale robotics well i think you do burden sharing from an alliance orcus pillar 2 context you come up with some innovation around what i like to call and i know it's been discussed the orcus visa where we can move skilled people in and out of respective jurisdictions very quickly to be able to, you know, epitomise Napoleon's sort of march to the sound of the guns philosophy, and that is where you put the right people on those discovery moments to scale rapidly. Uh, and then the other piece is how we think about expanding some of these partnerships to not allow blind spots to occur. So the South Koreans and the Japanese don't need to be necessarily part of the AUKUS framework as a partner. But a bit like with NATO and its Partners for Peace program, I don't think it should necessitate that they don't get access and opportunity when those discovery moments are made. And certainly in the case of those two countries, in many respects, they're far more advanced than we are. They have similar interests and we could all benefit from some further sharing in that regard. So that's about nine minutes. I'm going to pause there. I look forward to any subsequent questions. Again, thank um, the panel and my hosts and really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you from the wonderful Dallas airport. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's, it's not one of my favorites either. <laughs> <laughs> it could do with some robotics. So um, try San Francisco or San Diego, the better airports. Um, well, why don't we, uh, let me open with a question uh, to try to make things as concrete as we might be able to. Um, can any of the three speakers address how the approach of putting together, I guess, packages of, of uh, shorter range, uh, less capable, uncrewed systems might play out in, in an imaginary uh, scenario, let's say, in dealing with some kind of attack on, let's pick our favorite, you know, Taiwan, uh, vice uh, not having them and how that would be waged. That might might help catalyze or, or congeal. That's the word congeal. What the what the opportunities might be that that we're trying to capture. Don't all jump at once. Who wants to speak? Okay, go ahead. Oh. Uh, I was going to defer to Brian since he's just written a book. On this, so. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Henry, you know, the, there's certainly an opportunity with you know shorter, uh, or I guess to to you know Marcus's point, you know these uh, systems can be you know pretty long range. You know, so part of what you know we're we're looking at is less sophisticated uh, unmanned systems. So systems that have you know a limited number of functions, um, and in the case of the Taiwan you know scenario. They might need sufficient range to be able to get over to the Taiwan Strait uh, within 24 hours of uh, warning. Um, and they could do that from the Batanas Islands. They could do that from the Sakashima Islands uh, and position themselves inside the Taiwan Strait, basically preventing uh, an invasion fleet from being able to get there without being intercepted by this uh, force. You know, and they would act in a lot of ways as sort of mobile mines. You know, this they could you could establish kill boxes. They could operate within those kill boxes and basically attack anything they see. Um, the auto autonomy necessary for that kind of operation is, is pretty limited, well within you know, current technology's uh, ability. Uh, and it, it sort of de-risks de a lot of the aspects of unmanned systems that are currently you know, challenging, you know, doing multiple different functions, 
having to make decisions over a long period of time, having to uh, you know, operate in congested areas where you've got combatants and non-combatants. You know, a lot of that gets eliminated by this approach of really focusing on a defensive mission where they're acting essentially as a barrier to you know entry into somebody's territorial you know, land or, or waters. Um, so that 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 you could certainly apply that approach to other contexts. Um, but you might require more autonomy, more sophistication, um, you know, or more risk, <laughs> more risk tolerance. Um, so you can see with Ukraine, they've used a lot of these same systems to attack Russia's Black Sea fleet with pretty good effect. Uh, but they're expect accepting risk, you know, because there's a there's merchant traffic out there. There's there's the possibility of non-combatants getting involved, um, and they're willing to take that risk. So I think I think that's and you know Marcus's you know uh, system, the system that C two robotics is developing, Spear Tooth. It can do very long missions, you know, but it's it's a limited number of functions. But it can do very long missions, and you could give it sufficient autonomy to be able to you know, attack a particular target, you know, fixed target, or you could have it deploy something that then, you know, is a, an attack mechanism of its own, like mines. Um, you know, and that's probably still within the realm of current technology. Uh, but I think the challenge is always trying to constrain either the length of time it has to operate or the numbers of different things it has to do, or the, um, you know, sophistication with it, which it has to differentiate, you know, friend or foe or, or differentiate the right target from the wrong target. Um, and those are all things we've been trying to to de-risk in this hedge force idea, but that you could certainly you know open up that aperture if you're willing to pay for a more uh, complicated system and spend more time burning down the risk through experimentation. I could just amplify one thing before we turn to the other speakers who I'm sure want to add to this. Uh, and let's say you didn't have these packages uh, of uncrewed systems. How does the war look with regard to an attack against Taiwan then? Yeah, so we ran to, we built a simulation for our study um, and because we want to do something unclassified and the results came up pretty similar to what DOD gets routinely with its own analyses, which is um, the China, Chinese generally don't succeed. You know, they get a successful lodgement on Taiwan about a third of the time. Um, but in all cases, the losses on the defender side are enormous, right? So the U.S. loses. Basically, everything gets a mission kill, at least, uh, that gets engaged in that fight. Um, and then um, you have to bring in another kind of fresh supply of forces if you want to engage in a subsequent invasion attempt. And the difficulty is, you know, China could probably mount a second invasion attempt with, you know, less optimal platforms, but they could do it again with, you know, civilian ferries and um, other other ships that you know maybe are not as good as the initial ones. Um, so the losses are what really is the concern because that could drive uh, the decision making on the U.S. side to be uh, reticent to intervene. Right? If you know that everything you send in there is going to you know be at least a mission kill, how willing are you going to be to intervene on behalf of Taiwan um, when the time comes to do so? So this force actually takes a lot of that risk out because it um, it kills some of the invading ships on its own, but mostly it slows down and disrupts the invasion and forces them to activate their defensive systems that makes them more compliant targets. So our long range fires can engage them more efficiently and you don't have to get as close. So we can keep our forces mm -hmm. farther away. They don't get shot as much. And you, know, you get about the same amount of impact on the invading Chinese force. Okay. Uh, the other two speakers, do you have any takes that add to what we just heard? I'll, I'll make a couple of points. One is, one gets at Ian's fight point, and that is, you know, a lot of the sort of historical operations that I sort of call minnow operations, where you get these really crazy brave people and you put them in mini subs or human torpedoes, or they just swim into to ports and they attach limpet mines to ships, you know. Um, some of them have had actual strategic effect on campaigns. Half of them, you know, work pretty well. Half of them are absolute failures and everybody oh. dies. And then it takes six months or a year to find another bunch of crazy, very people to train up to do it. The we, What I would argue is sort of uncrewed systems can already do that. And it allows you to not just do it once, but to do it again and again and again. And just the ability to do that, I think, shapes an adversary's thinking. You know, that if you stop moving, we will be able to target you. You know, and I think in that sort of five, 10 year frame, time frame is we'll be able to do it when you are moving, you know, with autonomous uh, systems at, at scale. The, but I think the other thing we need to be aware of is 
is if we're doing this, the other side can do it. You know, I, I said Speartooth is an underwater Tesla. Last year, China made 8 million EVs, you know, electric vehicles. So they can also do this at, at scale. So th they can just swamp whether it's the Taiwan Straits, the South China Sea, pretty much anywhere, they can absolutely swamp it with these kinds of systems, which I think will make it really, really hard for us to use our exquisite crude system. So, you know, uh, SSNs, they're a great capability, but for 75% of the time, everybody knows exactly where they are. <laughs> they're in tied up in harbour or they're in a dry dock. Uh, having work done and you know what we're seeing from Ukraine is um, if you can be seen you can be targeted you know and I think that that kind of um, what we're seeing in Ukraine will flow through from the sort of short range kinds of conflict we're seeing in Ukraine to sort of much longer range conflict so just for example you take something like spear tooth and I'm not saying this is happening um, but it is it's very technically feasible is you can put 50 small killer drones on a spear tooth, you know, sail it, you know, thousands of kilometers, lurk a few kilometers out to sea and launch 50 killer drones off it. And, you know, just put 50 killer drones launching shape charges through a, a ship in port, a submarine in port. Um, if we can do it, the bad guys can do it. Yeah, I look again, Marcus. I, I, I um, only reinforce those points. I think there's a couple of other dimensions to this that if your first echelon forces are all robotic or autonomous, then you can do things like be the first mover and have first mover advantage. I think in terms of having to cross, you know, thousands and thousands of miles of ocean to be able to get to a an embarkation point for some sort of defensive or offensive offensive manoeuvre. Um, in East Asia, that's assuming you're coming from the West Coast, of course. But the other thing it might do is it might lower the threshold for decision. You know, a policymaker might be more inclined to use a robotic system because what I call the lost exchange ratio is far less than sending a capital ship you know, with 7,000 young men and women on it into a high-risk activity in the name of a security operation or um, some sort of offensive manoeuvre. So that dynamic changes. If you sort of, if you're Jomanian in, in terms of how you think about geometry, having a first echelon robotic and autonomous force that you push out far in advance of your main effort, which, which may or may not be also manned or unmanned, it changes the geometry because it puts you effectively on your own interior lines. So you can do things like run your own logistics, you can conduct better rear area surveillance, you can keep up all of those necessary functions of military manoeuvre inside that space that you control. So you can punch these things out and keep them on station in ways that you can't with other systems which dedicate 80% of their power and energy to keeping humans alive um, inside um, the little bubble that they exist in in that context. Um, the last point I'd make is again, and this is now comes into strategic calculation, if our robotic systems are in high intensity conflict with their robotic systems, has that hit a certain threshold where in an escalation context, the response becomes uh, more, um, more extreme and more catastrophic in terms of risk. So if we're gonna risk our entire robotic um, you know, division in the context of a first move advantage, and that is essentially neutralized by the other side's robotic division, what does that mean in terms of escalation? And is it always the case that you know, your last echelon are you humans and that's how you sort of prioritise. I think from, you know, an operational um, preservation context, I think it makes sense, but it may not be uh, the, the option that you wish to pursue in, in terms of escalation. And sorry, and just building upon that, um, you know, everyone will be familiar with the US Marine Corps stand-in force concept, which is about getting inside those contested zones left of bang. Well, let's think about that in terms of autonomous systems where you could have a dual purpose system that effectively performs uh, a, a function that allows it to hide amongst the noise and a function that could be quite legitimate but then at a certain point you can then weaponize for its true mission in the context of a military capability so there's so many options that come out of the standing force concept that the marine corps are sort of um you know using at the moment to explain how they're going to contribute to this fight that changes the dynamic once you bring this technology to the fore thanks
yes. I mean, I. Uh, the only other thing I'm wondering is uh, something you've all touched upon. Uh, in you know, Americans, whenever they want to spend a lot of money, they say, "Well, we need to do this for deterrence," uh, which is not that easy to demonstrate <laughs> without a war. Uh, but of course, if it works, you won't have a war. So it's the dog that doesn't bark. But we've loved this framing of issues with regard to commitments to finance things. I'm curious, do you, any of three of you have a narrative that speaks to the desirability of deterring, let's say in this case, China, and whether this helps, hurts, or is irrelevant? Well, I think theoretically it helps because it's a relatively affordable and achievable way of imposing cost on China. So if if if, if they do that, that kind of you know classic amphibious attack on on Taiwan, I mean it just allows you to throw more stuff against what what they're using and it will inevitably impose cost. Now, will that completely de deter them? I, I don't know. You have to sort of get inside Xi Jinping's head to sort of understand that. But right. I, I think it is, it is, you know, it generates mass, which is affordable, uh, an affordable way of imposing cost. But of course, you know, as, as Ian was sort of talking about, they, they're doing the same thing to us. So it allows us to take our exquisite platforms out of the equation or, or have them further back so it reduces the cost on us and specifically on the on the Taiwan scenario I mean mm -hmm. in a sense the US has depth here it can operate from its human people platforms from further back um, and you, you can deploy your uncrewed systems further forward if, if China wants to win that classic invasion scenario it's got to bring people into that that fight so uh, I think there is a inherent asymmetric mm -hmm. advantage mm -hmm. in that specific scenario. I'm not saying it, it applies to all potential scenarios uh, where the U.S. and its allies could be in conflict with China. Okay. Very helpful. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, yeah, one thing to build on that is I think the, it's um, these unmanned systems can give you the ability to not just generate mass, but to generate um adaptability you know so as, as marcus was saying you could field a wide variety of these and and it's not really a huge cost to have you know a large variety of, of payloads on these different unmanned systems um you can get more adaptable systems of systems and operational concepts so the move counter move competition with your adversary is much more sustainable than it is if you were to fight this move counter move competition with man platforms that are highly integrated and require significant costs to deliver you know to introduce new capabilities into them um, and also that you can mix and match, you know, collection of unmanned systems in a lot of different ways that present different looks and create dilemmas for your opponent. So you you get into a, a move counter move competition, not just on the technology side, but also on the operational concept and tactics side um, that, you know, I think could force your enemy to always feel like they don't have the risk uh, calculations you know, quite where they want them. So it's a way of dissuasion more than it might be a way of straight, straight up deterrence. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think Brian and Marcus are right. I mean, the other element to this is um, that escalation at ladder. You're going to lose control quickly because they're going to come for you. So they're going to come for your network. They're going to come for your um, ground control stations. They're going to come from where you operate these systems, and that makes uh, some of your command and control centers in CONUS and in other countries, friendly countries, legitimate military targets. So. Um, that means tempo will rapidly accelerate in the context of the initial uh, exchange of hostility. So it won't be, you know, a chess field somewhere uh, east of Taiwan. It'll be that, but then it'll also be the factories these things are built in, their supply chains, uh, individual um, scientists and, you know, important uh, human components to that system. For many, they will now be perfectly legitimate military targets in the same way that we might target um, you know, other countries and their nuclear weapons programs by going after the scientists themselves, you know. So so that, that escalation ladder goes horizontal and vertical very quickly. And again, I think you then risk 
conflation and escalation, which you know you lose control of. It's not a reason not to use these systems and fulsomely invest in them, but there needs to become a strategic doctrine around the understanding of their application in the same way that we did, you know, with Bernard Brody in the 50s as it relates to the atomic weapon. Yeah. Well, so um, on, on that point, if the Chinese are listening, I just want them to know I'm not an engineer, so I can't <laughs> find spear too. So don't come looking H for me. A H E L L Y E R. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the address is coming later. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think what this does suggest is that the future warfare is going to require an emphasis on, a, on the decoying syllable, the movement syllable, and the proliferation syllable, and that concentrating mass with regard to command and control is a big a mistake. I mean, we're going to have to figure out how to operate in a distributed fashion. Yeah. Packet switching comes to mind. You know. mm. I have hogged this. We need to hear other questions and comments. Now, I don't want you all to jump at once, but if you raise your hand, you will be called up. Oh, there we go. Uh, oh. Yes, Ms. Jacket, why don't you proceed? Thank you so much. And it's lovely to see Marcus and Ian and others online. I really enjoyed the insights. My question, it might be for Marcus, and it really comes down to industry's capacity, whether that's in Australia or the US, to actually deliver these types of systems at scale in a relevant time frame, i.e. a potential time one scenario, because I've been quite interested in the US to see industry feedback on the replicator initiative here in the US and the fact that their supply chains can't necessarily produce tens of thousands of systems that the Pentagon may be seeking. Um, so how well positioned are countries to, like the US and Australia, um, how well are they positioned to take advantage of some of these systems that we've been talking about? Uh, well, I, I take your your point about the limitations but i'd argue we're actually better placed to do these things than traditional military systems i mean so how is ukraine scaling up to hundreds of thousands and you know, potentially millions but you've actually got people sitting around dining tables you know building them themselves because so much of this is is very simple um so speaking from c2 robotics perspective so we've looked into you know how do we scale up you know, actually, at the moment, we have four spear tooths, you know, sort of made in this very mandrolically cottage industry kind of approach. How do you scale up? Well, despite all the sort of notices of the death of Australian manufacturing, we actually have pretty robust manufacturing sector in some fields, particularly the fields that supply our mining industry. I mean, how is it that Australia leads the world in digging up and exporting minerals that, um incredibly competitive prices. Well, so we have a manufacturing sector that supports that activity. So what we're trying to do is to tap into that, that industry. So if we have to produce spear tooths at scale, we'll go to companies that, you know, make injection molding forms for the mining industry and you, you, you set up a mold and they can pump out spear tooth fuselages at, you know, a rate of dozens per day. So, to me, part of the issue is um, draw on your, your your defense industry strategy kind of needs to mirror your broader industry. And so if you have robust manufacturing in, in one uh, civil sector, you know, draw on that as, as much as you possibly can. And I think that will allow you to scale. You know, that said, there are there are limitations. So as I said, Spear Tooth is an underwater Tesla. Australia doesn't make batteries. We are we get our batteries from uh, Japan and South Korea. Um, in time of war, those supply chains will inevitably be disrupted. So, uh, you know, that is a challenge. Uh, one workaround is on day one of the war, every Tesla owner in Australia gets an email saying, show up to this point. Uh, tomorrow um, and be prepared to walk home because we're requisitioning all of your batteries just as in World War II you, the, the state requisitions all, all liquid fuel so uh, so look it is not a you know it's, it will not solve everything but what I would say is this pathway actually I think is 
better than the traditional pathway. I mean, try scaling the production of, of SSNs in wartime. You know, try scaling the production of F-35s in wartime. I think you'll find it's easier to, to scale the small, the smart, and the many. Well, in fairness to the questioner, I, I think the point was uh, scaling before war. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, things like ITAR and other inanities um, have to come in the crosshairs. And, I, you know, uh, you know, AUKUS might very well be most important is serving as a battering ram to break down those bureaucratic structures. Uh, I don't know how yeah. successful we are yet. My, my own yeah. is not enough. But, I think uh, that's exactly exactly yeah. right we talk about AUKUS pillar one and pillar two but you know i think there's also pillar three which is all of those you know um itar breaking down itar you know harmonizing our export control regimes all of those things you know so you know to me that's pillar three and I, that's actually an area where you know uh change is occurring hopefully change for the better which remains to be seen at this point well, you got a low standard to, to exceed robert yeah, thanks. So, I mean, Henry, I, I kind of echo what you just said, is that um, the, the the way to get at this is it's not a question of industry. It's actually a question of American and, and allied acquisition process. Uh, I mean, if the point was made earlier, if the Ukrainians can build 100,000 of these, we should be able to crank out a few million. And um, in, in if I had my druthers, pillar three of AUKUS would be, if you're underneath the American security umbrella, uh, we're going to waive all ITAR. And we're going to waive licensing agreements and we're going to let, you know, if it, any NATO countries or Australia, Japan or South Korea build American weapons under these licensing agreements, go do it. So if we're willing to use nuclear weapons in your defense, then by God, we should be able to share this technology with you and crank this out. Like I, I have I have no doubt that the Western democracies industrial base can crank these things out at scale far quicker than than Virginia class subs. And I say this as a fan of Virginia class subs. Um, but, you know, the bureaucracy, Catholics is battling mightily to build a few thousand drones a year. And, um, you know, to quote Twisted Sister, if that's your best, your best won't do. We have to be building out hundreds of thousands of these things at yeah. scale. So we did I mean, a session several years ago, uh, I think almost immediately after AUKUS was announced on ITAR, and all I can say is uh, it may take a nuclear weapon to make that to go away. <laughs> yeah. It really I mean, is unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, war's got a great way to clarify and, 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 and centralize your attention. So, thanks. Yeah. So, someone else, I, I realize we've kind of run this thing way beyond the, the limit, but uh, are there other questions? I don't, I don't. I don't mean to cut off discussion. The last question was really quite good, by the way. Well, silence is a scent. I think I'm going to to capture this and run with it. I, I'm I'm a little distressed that uh, you know Brian has become sort of a, a, a sort of a, a Michael Hanlon like entity. He he tears around to to other other projects with great rapidity. So he's gone. Uh, and I am loath to announce exactly what we're going to do for the next session uh, without him present. So I'm going to use him as the excuse to keep you in mystery. But uh, this uh, series is not over. I don't think it will be over until someone puts a wooden stake in AUKUS. Uh, I do see it as the, a sort of a pacing discussion for thinking about future warfare. And if it was not that, I don't think it'd be terribly interesting, but I think it is. And on that note, we will get back to you on our next session as soon as Brian and I settle up on what to focus on next. Appreciate you all coming.